Oops. Welcome to the Science Track at Con Carolinas via Continual. Um, I'm Jim Nettles. I will be your moderator this morning. I'm also the Science Track Director. Um, I'm going to have my guests introduce themselves. I'm going to start with Les to my left. 20-year uh, professional engineer in mechanical uh, engineering, uh, building industry mainly. So uh, accessibility and those kind of things are a feature of what I do as part of my day job. So. Uh, a disabled former geneticist, former gardener, former everything um, because of my disability and probably due to all the chemicals I use as a geneticist, as a gardener and all the rest of it. So those things are really important to me and maybe I notice them more now. I am Faith Hunter. I am the uh, author of 40 plus books and I think for the purpose of of this panel, I am the writer of the Junkyard Cat series and the Jane Yellow Rock series and the Soulwood series, which are published under the Faith Hunter name. And my interest in accessibility and slower and having some sort of inflammatory condition that makes me aware of uh, accessibility issues and also because blindness runs in my family and my mother and father both. Uh, my father was nearly blind by the time he died. Mother has lost a great deal of her vision and probably has about a quarter of the vision she used to. So I have a real strong interest in and, and appreciation for accessibility issues. So we want to kind of look at accessibility, how we see it represented in science fiction and fantasy, and we're going to spend time today looking at both positive sides of it, negative sides of it, how it is and sometimes and often isn't represented. I mean, one of the first times I remember seeing in science fiction true accessibility and represented in a way that seemed positive was actually Geordi LaForge on Star Trek Next Generation. You saw the visor, you still see times where he's suffering from the pain that's related to it, but you also see the times he gets to benefit from that. And that was one of the first times I really remember seeing something represented positively. So from you guys' perspective, what was the first thing that really struck you within the genre of, of accessibility? Well, for me, it was Jordy Forge as well. Um, and I liked how they took his blindness, which was a definite disability, but then with the augmentation of his visor, they were able to adapt his disability into something that was very positive for his job. As far as engineering, he was able to see outside the normal vision spectrum. He was able to trace gases and stuff with what they were giving him through his visor. And Star Trek did very well as far as when he loses his visor, it's a very debilitating to lose that advantage he got back from his augmentation. It's, so, I mean, they used it both in a positive and a negative, which I kind of appreciated them to take check in that full spectrum. I'm older than you guys. Um, my background is with my, my father worked for DC back in the day when I was just learning to read. Nothing better than learning how to read on comic books. My first experience would have been with Daredevil. He was blind, but he, and he was blind when he wasn't Daredevil. He had his stick. I really think he should have had a dog, but that's a whole different story. But that was the first time I think I recognized that this was different, but there wasn't a whole lot of things between him and Jordy. There were a few, but it seems like it was mainly comic book. And I'll take it back maybe farther than that to the ship who sang and all of those brain ship. Um, oh. <laughs> because here was a child who was totally without the use of her body. In every case, it was a very young person who had no use of the body at all and then to the brain of the ship. And now this disabled child melded with this amazing ship and could go anywhere. And to me, that was like, I wanna be that. I, wanna, I wanted my brain to be able to go, anywhere in the universe and do all of these fabulous things and yet the problem was that even 
the, the pilot of the brain ship didn't understand the limitations of this poor child who had been, well, physically, I guess, placed into the ship and wired. And, and his view of her was always difficult. And he was always adjusting to the fact that this was a real person, but I can't get to them. They're not, they're not really here in the seat next to me. They're not physically here. And so the interactions were amazing to me. And I thoroughly loved every bit about those books. So we see certain things, uh, you know, represented in the comics. You know, we see Professor X in a wheelchair. We see other characters placed in wheelchairs. Who character-wise are some of the people we see that really are represented in using things that we typically do every day currently from an accessibility standpoint? And then where do you see some of those gaps coming in? You know, because we don't see, we're seeing more of it now. We, we've not seen a lot of the time characters represented who have particular disabilities or limitations. And it, it's been one of those things that we're seeing more of it now and we're seeing people represented now much more in a positive light as complete and whole people and complete and whole characters. Instead of a lot of the time in the past, it's been the, we saw you know a kid on crutches or in a wheelchair that was in the crowd that, that the hero had to rescue. But I think we're now starting to see people represented much more wholly and much more completely. But it's also how do we see those uh, those technologies also being brought in represented as well. So if we look at that, you know, what are things that you see that have been done very well um, in fiction and things you would also consider influential? I guess influential is is the thing that's throwing me off because we've all read different things. And so to me, influential will be how it affected my view of the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's really what you want. I think you're asking for influential in terms of what has affected society. I'm actually good with either way because you, just because if it influences you, it's unlike, undoubtedly influenced others as well. So, I mean, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be something like we, we've seen globally, like the idea of I want the visor. We've seen technology now being worked towards influenced and actually inspired by the Geordie LaForge visor. We, we know that that technology is being worked on now. And in fact, there've been several really successful pilots lately, but I mean, it can also be something that was influential to you, something you've seen that was meaningful to you personally, because again, we're still looking at the silent science. We're still looking at the influence of that. And this is something we're looking to as well to share the community here for people who may not be aware of it. I'm going to get touchy feely on you, but it is still science. Um, blindness is something that Faith and I actually have in common. Um, one thing with the people like Daredevil or Jordi LaForge is that they need to have something to cue them, otherwise they are blind. One of the things that I wanted to do was to help those that couldn't. So we did a lot of different kinds of um, sensory gardens that were accessible. And while that sounds touchy-feely, and it gets you back to the basics, the science behind it is the psychology. And it was a really major thing because the first one that was done in the area was done at the botanical gardens that I was working at when I was in grad school. And I'm sort of proud of it. We had some problems. We ended up putting them in raised beds because it wasn't just people that couldn't see, but also so that um, people could get at that height so they wouldn't have to bend. But that was kind of a fun thing. And, I, and you get so much more from if you're going into an aviary, if you're going into a greenhouse, something like that, you get all the, yeah. the smells, you get the feels, you get the tactile sensation. So I could see, definitely see that. It was playgrounds that were accessible to um, disabled children, which you never saw before. The first time I went by and there was a playground area of chairs, it was amazing. And I felt like we'd come so, far just to see that 
for children who have possible to walk, they can still go out and get on a merry-go-round and strap in their little, their wheelchairs and go around and around on a merry-go-round with all of the other kids. And it was, it was, to me, it was a sign of, of better things. And then on TV and on books, and I'm not going to, sad thing, I can't remember the author's name. The, um, the, the character's last name was Rhymes, and he is completely disabled. He is, I think, and has no movement of any kind, complete quadriplegic, and he is in bed solving crime. A partner who's out there wearing a camera and uh, a mic, and they're solving crimes together because he is the brain, and she's the brawn. I um, thought it was amazing. Dark Angel was a little bit like that. Yes, that it really was. And I adored that show. But I think it's a terrible loss that when it went away. Being a little younger, despite the uh, gray in my beard, uh, I came up through the 80s stuff and growing up, I saw you know Professor Xavier in his wheelchair and you know Jordy LaForge on TV. And I think one of the biggest things that those did, I didn't realize then that I realize now more because of what happened to me for my job is that what they did for Professor Xavier and Joy LaForge is they weren't handicapped. They, they weren't handicapped people. They were people. Professor Xavier just happened to sit down all the time. He was always in a chair. You know, Joy LaForge could work and maneuver around and get around the ship with his visor. So while they, were, while they had disabilities or handicaps, they weren't handicapped people. They weren't ostracized or treated any different than a regular person. That's one of the things that I didn't know at the time, but I definitely appreciate now. And it definitely influenced how I look at implementing accessibility in current, in current building designs and why I look at some of the future tech that we're seeing on Star Wars, Star Trek, and other things that, like, you know, that's, for this very advanced society, you're missing a couple people that could have, you know, need to be incorporated into your society that, um, that can't get around these ships or get around these, uh, sites without extravagant uh, augmentation. You remember the Star Trek empath who was, I think she was completely blind and she wore a dress, which was nothing but censors. Oh yeah. Yeah. She got around, she was completely, completely mobile, completely a part of the team but she could not see she was completely blind and that was that was to me a, absolutely amazing and that was original star trek i'm pretty sure yeah well, that was original way before geordie way before way before anyone thought of being able to cure or treat the kind of blindness that runs in my family so to me that was like really cool because i already had a grand a great grandmother who was blind yeah, and original Star Trek tackled a lot of, yeah. even if it wasn't necessarily targeted towards uh, various disabilities and whatnot, it was still, you could find a lot of concepts and the cost of some of the things. You know, when you look at ones like the brains that were just in a bubble that reached out through avatars, you know, yes, they had immortality, but they had immortality with the three of them stuck for, you know, stuck together forever. You know, that's, the odd couple in a really horrible way. Um, so I think the original series brought a lot of a lot of those concepts forward, even when they weren't necessarily targeting that that topic. One of the things that to me was also really an interesting and very influential show, and even though it didn't last that long, was Mantis. Oh yeah, because it was the first time you saw a person of color shown with wealth and building an exoskeleton because he just wanted to walk again. And in the process of this, he decides he has to become a superhero too, because that was just what he had to do. And it was the right thing to do. But the fundamental driver behind it was you saw somebody who built the technology to regain just basic functions. And again, I think that's one of the things we've seen as an influence in building exoskeletons to help allow people to walk as supporting instruments. Uh, and a lot of that sort of technology is coming along as well. So from a positive standpoint, what ways have you seen in fiction, science fiction, 
representation of some of these other technologies and maybe ones we're starting to see come about now. Lee Majors, the $6 million man. Yep. And the current mm -hmm. prosthetic devices that are out. Yes. Amazing. Except for the $6 million man versus Bigfoot episodes. Those were just rough. <laughs> okay. I agree. We're just going to talk about his handsome exterior. Oh, never mind. He was pretty. He was very pretty. <laughs> and he was a good guy, too, so that made you happy. He wasn't a, a bad guy who'd been augmented and was going around doing evil stuff. He was just an American hero astronaut. You're yeah, cool just American happened hero. to be there. Got broken. They fixed him. They owned him. Oh, yep. never mind. <laughs> I've been binge watching uh, Star Trek Discovery and they have many of the crew members have some sort of disability, whether from the war with the Klingons or however they got them, but they all have different types of augmentation to allow them to interact with their other crewmen without any disadvantages. So uh, that one's got several pieces in there. Because we've got all these amazing scanners now that do all these amazing pictures of the inside of the human body and they have that. And it kind of, if you remember the scanner that covered them from one side to the other and they were being scanned up and down and it was actually doing surgical work and, and um, we've got all these robotics in, in, in the surgery department now. And um, it, I find that absolutely amazing. I would love to, to see that. And the lasers that are being used on eyes now. Laser recipient. Um, and it has made a huge difference in my ability to see and the longevity of my sight with my eye condition because I had laser three and a half years ago and I happened to turn out to be a fantastic candidate. Medicine free, no drops, no nothing, I can see. And maybe every three years I'll have to have another laser. You can see. I can um, see. My wife got LASIK a few years ago, and the fact that she can walk around without glasses, and now that I have to, is is getting is a little irritating to me. But um, it, it's wonderful to see that you know, we've been married for 20 years, and she can finally walk around without any glasses. She doesn't have to worry. You know, she's not blind when she wakes up in the morning. Um, I still, I still have to wear. I still have to wear glasses. My laser is because of glaucoma. It's a whole different, whole different thing. I actually receive a very specific wavelength of laser. Is that the right word? Um, it pokes holes in my iris and it's, it goes and they poke huge holes in my iris so my, I have a, an unusual kind of glaucoma and then I come back two days later and they make sure this is okay and they do this eye and then I'm miserable for a week and then I can see. But you can see. I can see and I don't have to have right now the horrible surgeries that my mom has gone through. I think possibly bionic somewhat myself. I have a, what is it called? A, um, Stin, is that the word? Uh, no, it's a, uh, a DRG, uh, stimulator. Right. It doesn't, it's not a spinal cord stim. It, um, goes to, I, I'm having a complete brain fart. It Anyhow, it, there's a Goes to your leg. Well, no, yeah, eventually. Um, it goes to where the spinal cord, the major nerves leave the spinal cord. So it doesn't have to go into the meninges that surround the spinal cord. D or G, I'm trying to remember what the heck D. Oh, dorsal root ganglion. There we go. The wires go from my... There's a battery pack, which I can feel, which is kind of nasty, about the size of a cigarette pack that is um, in a pocket in my back. Then there's two more scars for the two wires, one going to the sciatic nerve, the other going to one of the lumbar nerves. It causes white noise so that I have a neurological condition and it's kind of constant pain in my foot. It's called complex regional pain syndrome. Some days are better than others. I can adjust that stim. So it's pretty much the same thing as somebody listening to white noise to go to sleep. 
it's always there. It's a background and it doesn't get rid of the pain. It just makes my brain mask it a little better. Uh, it's, it's interesting. I'm not sure how anybody ever came up with the idea. The bad thing is I can be hacked. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Well, yeah, it is. I don't know why anybody would want to hack me, but they could, they can, they adjust my stim whenever I go in for an appointment. So yeah, if I was just walking on the street, somebody could make me very painful, I think. But That's other horrible. Pardon? Horrible. Yeah, it's not the best thing, but you know, it beats the alternative. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's science. Yeah, and that's also back to safety and security and privacy and some of the stuff we were going to talk about this weekend, but or we're not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that panel got canceled. Um, uh, yeah, I know. So, oh, and Les, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Um, I, I, would, I went and looked up because one of the things I think is coming around now that's coming out of sci-fi and tech is prosthetics with either being able to control them mentally with your mind without any direct connection or just the fact that they can just the limits going from the old captain hook to now being able to grasp things, maneuver, manipulate things with hands. And um, I mean, should we have a sprinter that was a world-class sprinter, sprinter with amputeed legs? I mean, because of his ampu his prosthetics he was able to put on. So I think a lot of, a lot of that's being influenced by what science fiction and technology that we had wet, uh, a while ago. Well, I mean, uh, you see a lot more things that that are external to the body. They don't require surgery, but that you can actually use other biological controls. You can use, you know, uh, they can basically put the, uh, the, the uh, I forget what the name of the band is, but you can wear the band around the brain that picks up the electrical impulses off the brain and use that to steer and control different devices. Um, you know, Stephen Hawking famously was able to type and write using eye controls with an interface. So, I mean, a lot of these are astounding technologies that we have that I think that we've seen those technologies influencing fiction to go further. And I mean, we've all talked about how we see fiction influencing science to progress and come up with new ideas. And I think this is one of the responsibilities we have as writers is when we find, if we create a need is also to find a solution to that in the hopes that maybe that inspires someone to find the actual technological solution for it. I want to talk a little bit about where we see stuff not represented correctly or even times where it gets twisted around. Um, you know, we've seen things like Doc Ock, you know, and having, you know, the full exoskeleton and becoming the evil villain and stuff like that. But I also, there's a story and I was trying to find it and remember the author and I, I can't remember it, but it's about the time of when humans basically grow into their cars they basically merge with their vehicles and it's a have versus have not situation, but it's all about you live, breathe, eat, sleep, die in your car basically. And it's because people have become too dependent on a particular technology. And it's one of those things while not necessarily a technology geared toward to solve a disability problem. It was one of those things that when in the phrasing of the story, some of that started because of people that did not or that had mobility issues and basically started to fuse that technology. And so we've seen a lot of things where the technology goes wrong, but I'm looking more for how, in ways that technology doesn't necessarily go wrong, but either it's just not represented correctly or we see people, you know, really ab ending that technology and, in using it for the bad, uh, using for the evil purposes instead of coming and saying this is how it could be used for good. Genetic research. That's why I have Midas, Mindy, um, uh, one of my specialists who vets all of my books and tells me to change this and change that. No, you can't do this. And you've got CRISPR. And <laughs> I, I can, I, the, the, the sociological terror that could be released on our society um, through uh, genetic manipulation is, is terrifying. And I think that they've done a pretty good job in all through science fiction talking about enhanced humans and how they would uh, be the next, the next 
uh, evolutionary foot of humans and the good and the bad that can come from all of that. I was thinking of, of CRISPR and the positives and the negatives. The simple thing, just wondering where my husband is so he doesn't hear me. He had a lot of uh, patents, he does patent attorney, that were um, genetic based and they all got trashed the day that CRISPR was released. Now with CRISPR, they're finding out that, you know, a few drawbacks, sort of like what happened to Dolly, you start messing around with things and you end up with cancer. So that's the positive and negative about current genetic research. Short term, positive. Long term, not so positive. Right now. Will things change? Yeah. Unless we lose funding for everything, in which case, maybe not so fast. So genetics, by, on its own, has a failsafe for positive and negative, which is kind of interesting to me, to Faith. Don't know it about anybody else. That was my insert for CRISPR. I was thinking more of Oracle, where she was really good character. She was um, Batgirl originally, Barbara Gordon. She lost the use of her legs, went into a wheelchair. Oh boy, how sad the female has got to be protected, except she became an amazing character. Who, who cares that she was in a wheelchair? She was very tech. And then they got rid of her and made her back into Batgirl, meaning that wheelchairs were bad. So it kind of works both ways there too. I mean, here we had a woman who looked powerless and yet was sort of the idea behind somebody in bed who was incapacitated, who was able to work with somebody else. Uh, your black angel, is that it? Oh, it was a black canary. A black canary. I don't think I saw that. I don't watch a oh, lot of television. Yeah. yeah, Dark Angel was like I said. There were there were some correlations between Dark Angel and Oracle and the black canary sort of motif. There were some connections there. At least some influences, I would say. Time to binge. I think one of the bigger failures from science fiction, at least visual media, because uh, mostly movies and TVs where I'm coming from, is the disparity between haves and have-nots, is the fact that as, you know, you're talking about advanced societies, but yet you still have the wealthy are the only ones who have the bionic skeletal structures or anything to help them move around and get them around society better. And, you know, um, Elysium, is it? The one with Matt Damon, where, you know, they all go to the high city, all the people who can't afford wealth, they've got the cure for cancer, they've got the cure for everything up there, but everybody's still left on earth. You don't get it because, well, we need you to just provide us food and don't worry about everything else. Um, and then, of course, you always have the misuse of advances. Um, Bloodshot, I just watched that movie, uh, where they came up with some really inventive tech to help someone who's got a breathing problem so that she can breathe any kind of atmosphere. She has a little filter on her. Um, they've got a guy who's got re replacement legs, another one who's blind, so he's got sensors all over, so he can see 360. And they, they show some pretty cool ways of using this technology, but of course the movie's all about how they've misused the technology to pro, um, for their own special gains. So I mean, it's, it's probably, but that's where the story is usually, is someone misusing the technology more than how in just a general plan of how you get through your daily life with this really cool tech. So let's talk a little bit more about fiction in general. When we look at the social side, the cultural side of how we see accessibility represented. Um, and we see both, you know, pluses and gaps. And I know as an engineer, Les, you're going to have, you know, some definite opinions on this one. Uh, you know, we see times where uh, there are not very many films you see that are set any, in anywhere but a modern setting that really feature a lot of the major safety kind of features that we would, we would expect. Uh, you know, but we see a lot of representation. So if I look at, at the original Blade Runner, 
and this is back to that haves or have nots, but you had entire artificial technology and biological period going on there. From an engineering side, uh, and we were talking about this a little bit before we got started, was looking at the Star Wars universe. So do you want to kind of talk about that a little bit, what you see in both pluses and negatives in that universe and other universes that represent the engineering well? What does it mean to society? How does it shape how the culture works? Um, one of the things I learned from my current job as a code official is accessibility is about inclusion, not exclusion. Um, it's about making things so that regardless of someone's stature, someone's disabilities or handicaps or, or other impediments they might have in front of them, they can still be inclusive in society and be able to do things. Um, some really silly things like a, a little four inch, uh, you know, four inches about, no, that's my, or it's just about that big um, rail across the, that uh, someone with a uh, cane can detect so they know where the edges of the walkway are. But yet in the Star Wars universe, we have bridges that, you know, there's couples, a couple of death scenes where someone falls off a bridge. Why they fall off the bridge? There's no railing. You know, a very simple safety feature that's there, you know, both for the able body, but a lot of times those safety features are there for disabled people, um, either for people with low vision or no vision. Um, one of the big mistakes, I don't, like, I don't see a lot of representation of people who are deaf uh, or dealing with a slow sound, a low ability to hear in, in future tech. Um, I think mainly just because in movies and, and it's kind of hard to show that. Um, but Star Wars is one of the worst ones. Star Trek's a little bit better. They, they generally have the, not only the rail, but they also have the glass to make sure no one falls underneath the rail. Um, those are just some of the big safety things that pop out at me. Uh, but there's other things too. Um, I don't want to monopolize, but uh, I'm trying to think of a specific example. So you have to come back to me on that one. I can't just think. I, I was just thinking about Star Trek and actually about everything. Are there any deaf superheroes? Well, deaf superhero is Daredevil, but he's got the ability of radar. So Right. I mean. But as far as advanced societies that are represented in science fiction i i can't think of any examples when we're talking a thousand years from now where technology should be there or ocular implant ocular implants i butchered the word apologize um or anything that help you hear i think the closest thing is on cloud city and star wars the assistant has this thing that comes around the side of his head they don't ever show what it's there for but it kind of represents that maybe he's deaf or and uses this technology to interface with the world around them. Um, it definitely gets them to interface to the, the city itself, but I don't think I could see any other ones. The six million dollar woman had a bionic ear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, one, no, he could have. Pre, but a precursor to. Right, he could have yeah. heard yeah. out of the original, but I'm just thinking so much of the original Star Trek is now picked up and I'm, going to say echo because there happens to be one in each of the rooms here and my house is open concept so if I say her name she will immediately start speaking so I'm gonna say echo because she does not answer to that everybody knows what I'm talking about yes okay um, almost everything is audible almost mm -hmm. everything is audible you say something in, you know, the elevator on uh, Star Trek, level eight, you don't poke a button. That's great if you can hear. Yep. And there will always, I mean, there won't always, but yeah, if you can do something with the ear, but there's multiple kinds of deafness. Mm -hmm. There's right. nerve mm -hmm. deafness, there's bone deafness. You know, a, an implant isn't going to fix nerve deafness. So now we have to create a whole neurological network. So yeah, it works. But I, I was just thinking that when you said something about hearing, there aren't any. And the, that's a shame. The same technology that would be used to fix the hearing nerve would be similar to the same would be used to fix um, retinal problems and uh, eye 
nerves. So it would be some sort of stem cell, something that would fix that. And there's a, yeah. we had an opportunity back in the nine, back in, well, right after 9-11, there was a lot of stem cell research going on that got canceled. Um, and all of it would have been something that would have been positive to my family with the kind of blindness that runs in my family. As long as you know that it's genetic, yep, mm -hmm. you but can do gone. gene therapy. Yep. Uh, no, but, but it's gone. There's nobody working on that right now. That, for what you're talking about, your particular, right? But there are plenty of stem. I just want to make that clear. It wasn't just. Oh yeah, the, it, it, it wasn't all of it. Yeah, it wasn't, it was your specific area because right. the guy who does patent law and every so often I'll, yeah, I, I'll see a few things. I can't talk about them, otherwise he gets upset. But that's, that's the thing that to me is, 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 is missing in a lot of science fiction is using the stem cell research that was going on and resurrecting it and, and applying it to people's lives because we're not, we, we, there, we have right at our fingertips research that was taking place that we could revive that could fix lots of kinds of blindness and, and lots of kinds of deafness and, and even fix spinal cords and damaged nerves like what Mindy's got. There were things in place, lost most of it. And it, well, some of it is being used on dogs. So progressive retinal atrophy, which is M, oh, I can't remember, PRACD, I think, one of the types, is also a problem with humans, um, mm -hmm. retinitis pigmentosa. Have a friend with that. Yeah, uh, they're doing um, uh, therapy now with dogs so it's not totally gone except it may never see humans right so basically the haves and have nots it comes back to if somebody really rich and really important can benefit from that therapy and this is me being cynical guess what therapy will suddenly be worked on guess what therapy will suddenly be funded because the haves have a need for it I suspect that the dog therapies are from the upper level class of people who can afford a string of show dogs. Yep. So you're probably right. They want to put it in there. However, it is the same disease. Sure. That's why so it's somebody in a human who, who's got the money and the power decides that they need it for their own reason because their child or their mother or their themselves, mm -hmm. they're going blind or deaf. The, 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 the research will be applied and made available for the rest of us because they need it. And that's the haves and nots. That's the powerful over the, the people without power. So as we look at this, one of the things I want to talk about, about and we've gotten into this somewhat, because I think it really is the driver behind all of it, is the society and the sociology. Because accessibility, and unless, like you said, it's not about exclusion, it's about inclusion. It's making sure that things are available to the largest audience possible. Things are available and usable by the society as a whole. That's, I mean, that's the entire driver behind accessibility. I have dealt with a lot of accessibility issues in the technology world, especially around internet, internet based technologies, where if you are building something that's browser based, you've got to be able to make sure it's readable and visible for people who have levels of hearing impairment. We're implementing much more vo voice based technologies as well to help augment all of those sorts of things. You know, um, you know, where you're able to do closed captioning, which is a fairly older, older technology, the AIs that will be able to caption what we're doing here are getting, you know, better and better. Um, we actually have, have intentions of trying to use closed captioning on a lot of the programming. Still trying to get that going and hopefully maybe by the time this comes out, all, some of the programming will actually be closed captioned for Con Carolinas. Um, if not, we'll be using it in the future as a part of Con Carolinas continual and some of the other programs going forward. 
all of these things are, you know, have benefit not only to some, for, for example, someone who's hearing impaired, but closed captioning is really beneficial to somebody who is sitting there, who is sitting on, on, you know, sitting on a bus or sitting, waiting on plane, sitting there in the office at you know, on lunch or something that wants to bring up a video and be able to see what's going on in it. You can read the captioning and follow the narrative. You can see what's happening without having to crank up the auto, the audible piece. So there's a lot of the time that there's multiple benefits beyond just the targeted group that something's intended to help. So from a sociological standpoint, and we've talked some about CRISPR, and I think that, that that's got both a lot of promise and a lot of risk to it. And I've talked about that on a lot of different panels and presentations and papers. But if you're looking at things from that sociological standpoint, what are the things that you see that sociologically and community-wise we've not really adapted to really be able to help certain communities that would help not only certain targeted communities, but would also help in general. You know, I think gene therapy is going to be a big one of those going forward. And that's got its pluses and negatives. Everything does. Yeah, that's the payment thing though. That's the haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. And I don't think CRISPR, well, that was supposed to be the all and end all, and it's not. That was kind of like saying that we've discovered everything in physics uh, over a hundred years ago now, right? Well, well you, they talked about closing the patent office in what, 1918, something like that, because everything had been invented. Had been. Yeah, and I think we all know that science is progressive, technology is progressive. We, you know, we go through phases where it is technology skyrockets. We see, you know, advancement, 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 advancement. And then we go through a phase of where we find new and better ways of using that technology and improving it. And it spreads more pervasively throughout, throughout the society. And right now we're in one of those phases where there's been a, over about the last 30 years, the internet alone as a sky has skyrocketed technologies we've got. I mean, we just look at the last 10 years alone. Now we're going through it. How do we continue to adapt these new technologies that have been built to build the foundation for the next great leap? And that's one of the things that I always see. And that's one of the things that I think that as creatives who are also in the scientific space and technological space, as creatives, we also get to look at what needs are out there and try to envision ways that they can be satisfied or filled through fiction. And hopefully that will inspire someone to work on the, the science, the technology, or sometimes it comes out of things that we are working on or have worked on or know people that are working on it. So, you know, like you say, CRISPR is not a silver bullet. There is, I don't really believe that there truly ever will be the one and only silver bullet except for the times we need it in fiction because it's easier than having the budget for it or trying to write up the whole big thing. I just need, I gave him a hypo spray. He's fine. Cure anything with a hypo spray. Cure anything with a hypo spray, except for a hangover. If you went out with Scotty. Um, well, so from that sociological standpoint, what are things that you're not necessarily seeing used or represented that you would like to try to see used and represented? especially if it was in hopes of trying to inspire some work to be done. I know of work that's being done that isn't being used in science fiction. Um, I was at UWM, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. I was uh, running the labs and the greenhouse um, for the biology department. And a lot of research was in um, finding new microbes, soil microbes for medicine, for antibiotics. And you don't hear about microbial activity as anything other than usually negative unless they're drinking something unique. So that's something that exists. There's a lot right now of research at the microbial level, but that one was one that was fascinating. That lab was actually, oh, it was really well-funded which makes sense. And they were coming along really well, except for every so often we get an email about going in, you know, whoever left the biohazardous waste in the autoclave room, please come and get it. 
kill it and dispose of it. But other, Faith, I sent you that email. You did, that's why I'm laughing. <laughs> I mean, that, that was one of my jobs in the hospital when I first started out was <laughs> everything in the autoclave. Because back then, the laboratory had its own autoclave. We did, we, we sterilized our own auger and poured it out for the bacteri bacteriology department. We made everything from, from scratch in the laboratory and we had to clean our own equipment. So what you're talking about, about people leaving things in the... Uh, the autoclave that they should not have or close to it or waiting their turn. See, that's what's going to turn out. The whole world is going to have a problem because one Cavalier grad student left some things in the autoclave room that they shouldn't have. Simple or some, somebody walked out of a lab somewhere with a disease they shouldn't have <laughs> been playing with. Are we not seeing that now? I mean, we're not quite to the stand yet. I mean, <laughs> kind of getting that. Um, one of the things I think coming more at it from an engineer than a scientist standpoint is um, a lot of times we don't know what we don't, well, we don't know what we don't know. So being an able body person that walks around everything, I wasn't quite as aware of the accessibility needs of people until I was part of my job and I had to be aware of it. Um, but one of the things as engineers, you can only implement technology you're aware of. And I think the advancement of the internet, which increases anybody's, information base will allow technology to continue to be modified and developed to help out more accessibility or just advance society in, in general. Um, nine times out of ten, I think a lot of the technology you see implemented in this great and amazing new way, the technology, whoever thought of it, didn't develop it for that. They were developing it for something else. Um, going back to microwaves, microwaves were never the object of develop, working on that technology. It was trying to come up with a better radar not figuring out how to heat up water <laughs> and one chocolate bar later yeah one chocolate bar later and that's how a lot of technology gets implemented it's like the scientists are these got these great ideas and they're trying to develop those and then either they find a need or someone who has a need and then sees that technology and says if we twist this technology a little bit we can use it over here and i think that's one of the things that, as writers and creatives that we get to do a lot of times is that we read this cool technology oh what if it was like this Science and by serendipity. Yeah, and we take this all the time. Exactly, and then we take it a little bit further. Then the scientists who read our fiction come back and say, "You got a point, but you got a little wrong. So let's just tweak it, and this is how it really works." And we end up with cell phones. What is it? Mm -hmm. Lucite? No, not lucite. One of the uh, plastic polymers that we use for everything. Um, it polymerized. He came back, and it's like, oh wow. I mean, this is a dangerous thing. He left. A beaker full of something and the next day discovered this clear solid substance that we now have what is that called in refrigerators and and everything else the plastic um, but all i can okay. think of is pvc and i know that ain't right no no it's, 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 it's it, anyhow brain fart but um a, a common chemical that was used for uh they, they were making it as a dye a textile dye it's bright mm -hmm. orange surflan is a common herbicide because it worked for that. Um, they were working on warfarin as, uh, well, for heart problems, which is great at a certain level, but warfarin works great as a rat poison. I collect these things. You know, it's, it's all these bizarre things that, uh, uh, that, that penicillin, mm -hmm. surprise, look. Mm -hmm. The plaque is dying. What? I think most science, at least from the macro level, it's been science by serendipity. Ah, post-it notes. The sticky mm -hmm. didn't work. Well, I mean, a lot of the time, I, you know, it's happy accidents. It's, I didn't get the result I wanted, but there's a use for what I did come up with. And again, I, that's one of the reasons that I was wanting to make sure we did this panel is, A, we could talk about some of the accessibility things that we have and haven't seen in fiction. But again, you know, one of the things that I believe when you have both the creative side and you're working in the sciences, you're working in the engineering, you're working in technology, is you have both then the creativity to come up with, huh, well, this works this way, what else can I do with it? It's the inspiration. And I think that's where we come up with both 
a responsibility and an obligation, as well as the advantage of being able to play with ideas and take them sometimes to, you know, their, their most twisted conclusions, because, well, that's the fun part to do is how do I kill somebody with it? Okay. Well, occasionally you don't kill somebody with it, but that's not as much fun. Um, but I mean, as we look at these sorts of, of issues of accessibility, I think the more we address them, the more we talk about them, the more we raise these ideas, the more effective these technologies will become. And we also then see how these technologies then expand through the rest of society and bring benefit. If we look at voice recognition technologies that you know started with Dragon that now come up to Cortana that now come into those things that shall not be named because then inevitably we would start a whole cascade of them in the background. Um, Thank you. you know, all of those sorts of things at least have some growth out of accessibility. These came from technologies that were developed for accessibility purposes and then everybody looks and says, well, that's actually useful for that. I mean, there's a lot of things that I work on currently that are using newer voice technologies to interface with technology and other ways, you know, other biometric ways of interfacing with technology other than just a mouse and keyboard. So, and these were all initially developed as tools for accessibility that are now reaching a greater market, which means they're going to be more affordable and we'll see better innovations for those people that are most in need of them. And I, that's one of the reasons I was really happy to do this panel. Um, There's the opposite too, where it was created just out there and it was, then applied in so many different ways, like lasers, mm -hmm. of course, were Star Trek early on. They're, they had these lights that shot out and did things and destroyed things, and, and now they can use them on my eyes. And now they can use them to do surgery. And it, it's everywhere. It's pervasive throughout our society. Started out as in science fiction and became reality, and I can see you can see i can see and i can sort of walk or hide. Mm -hmm. so we've got a couple of minutes left um what's one last thing everybody wants to throw out there from an accessibility standpoint we might not have talked about i'll throw out one because I, I see it get missed all the time in engineering and architecture currently and that is taking into account that fact that accessibility is not always about the permanently disabled but also the temporarily disabled, those people who get injured. Um, I'll be working on a building that say, oh, well, everybody who uses this building has to be able-bodied. They're, you know, they're police officers, they're, they're firefighters, they're you know, cadets at a military school. I'm like, okay, so when they go out on a ski slope and break their leg and are confined into a wheelchair for six weeks, what do you do then? And they're like, uh, didn't think about that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, Keep in mind that when you know you got keeping this to the creative, when you have characters that get injured, they're injured. They might become temporarily disabled, and then they'll have this disadvantage, and they'll have to try to figure out how to work in their society now with whatever technology might be available to them um, on a temporary basis. Uh, I'm Les Gould. Um, you can find me at lesgould.com. Follow some of the stuff I write. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and also on uh, Facebook, all as Les Gould writes. Um, and feel free to shoot me up with some engineering questions. Happy to answer them. Uh, building questions. Always fun to talk about. So. You can usually find me with Faith since I run her um, promotions. She made me work after I was disabled. She's evil. I've kept you busy. It's been a fun for both of us. It has been hysterical. So you can you usually find me at Let's Talk Promotions. Um, However, I also run genetics lists. I don't keep up my own uh, social media, mainly because it's more difficult for me to write now, although I do have uh, children's books that have a real strong environmental. And actually, I wrote about the Spanish flu for kids a few years ago. So yeah, if you want to find me, look for Faith. I'm usually tagging along there. And I'm Faith Hunter, and you can find me at faithhunter.net, not faithhunter.com. That's a beautiful limber yoga instructor's site. Uh, so faithhunter.net, and you can find me uh, mostly on Facebook. I do a very little Twitter. I can't 
stand Twitter, but that's because it's so easily becomes toxic to me. I like Facebook because I can just shut it down and not hear dings and not hear whatever. So I'm available on Facebook and a whole bunch of different sites. Just do a search for Faith Hunter and they'll start, they'll start tracking me down. Thank you. Thank you. Hi.